In this video, we are going to cover a simple basic pause menu. We will show the UI, hooking it up to the player, and then also adding a simple volume control. This is the pause menu that I'm talking about. Our player can play, we can push the key to pause, the game will continue running, however my character can't move and I can't look around. I have a quit button that will quit. And if I was to run this in its own window, we're actually going to see a close button down here to close it. We can also hit the P button again to both pause and unpause. So let's go ahead and look at how this set up. One of the keys here is all of the input is going through our character. The character controller, the player controller gets the input and then it passes along to the character and then the character processes the input for movement and for the mouse and the keyboard and any other input type devices. We've set up an input event for action called pause button. And you'll need to know that for later because it's important in the user interface. But pause button is our event. And I've got it mapped to the P key currently. What we do is we check and see if our pause menu reference is valid or not. This reference is created when we create our pause menu. If it is not valid, which it won't be the first time through, then we're going to go ahead and create our widget for our pause menu, set the pause menu reference, so now it will become valid, and then add that to our viewport. After that, we work on removing input from the player and making sure only our pause menu can have it. We do that by setting the input mode to game and UI. It is important we set it to game and UI, and we'll talk about that later. We show the mouse cursor. Then we grab the pawn that we're controlling and we disable input. This will disable input going to the pawn itself, but the controller will still take an input, which means our user interface can then take the input. So that's important to know. This node is disconnected and we'll cover that shortly. So once our interface is on the screen, we pass all control to the user interface itself. During construction, we set up a listen event. This event basically listens for an action name and will allow our user interface to take keyboard input. Now, earlier I mentioned we needed to make sure we knew the name, pause button, the same thing that is mapped in our character for our action, as well as the um, game mode being enabled. If game mode is not enabled, then input's not going to go to our controller, then we would not have this event. So it's important to make sure we have game mode enabled for input, either game only or game and UI, or else our user interface cannot get input. What this does is it basically listens. It allows our user interface to hear that input, and then we do something. And all we're doing is talking to our character and telling it that the pause button was pressed again, which we can see right here, which is basically just calling the same event again. So it allows us to easily either click our button or to press the PB P key while we're playing to open and close the menu. All the close button does, if we look at it, is close button calls the same thing, tells the player that the button was pressed. Now these next ones here we can ignore for now, that is for volume control, but that is the basics of our menu. Now there are a few things that are important to note here. When we're playing, if you notice, I have a little ball bouncing up and down. We're using the physics system and everything's running at normal speed. When I pause the game, while I cannot move the character with the mouse and I cannot move the character with the keyboard, our physics simulation is still running, which means anything in the game may still be functioning. What you can do is you can go to wherever you're pausing and you can change the global time dilation. I'm going to go ahead and hook this up. I'm going to hook it up here. Basically what this is going to do is whenever we bring up our menu, we set the global time dilation to 0.01. .01. You can't really do zero. If you do zero, it'll basically prevent your mouse from moving very well. So you can't use your user interface events. So now this is set up, we'll play this. We can see the ball in the background. We'll hit the P key and the ball is going to go ahead and stop. Now you notice it is moving very, very slowly. So you can always adjust your time dilation to be even smaller. We'll go ahead and pause this again. And you notice the ball has pretty much stopped. We have such a small 
time dilation that it really doesn't matter. Now this second branch up here, which I have not covered yet, is what happens when we have the pause menu up. We're basically going to do the opposite of what we've already done. We are going to remove the menu from the screen, set our reference to nothing, so that way when we check it next time, we will not have anything on the screen. We're going to go ahead and set the input back to game mode, disable the cursor, tell our pawn we want input again, and then set our global time dilation back to 1. So that's how we handle pausing and unpausing. Now that that's said, let's go ahead and add a simple volume control. Volume controls are something that are common and really simple to add in once you understand how it works in blueprints. If you're using C++, there is actually a global volume variable you can access and adjust. In blueprints, you have to use sound mixes. So let's see how this is set up. I'm going to go into my pause menu. I actually have this set up already. I'm going to go ahead and unhide my volume box so that way we can see it in use and it's now visible. And we're going to go ahead and play this example. Now I'm going to go ahead and unmute my sound here for my audio. And then we should be able to hear the sound once I play it. And that's going to be this button right here. And it's going to play a little bit of a sound. And you'll hear someone talking. Now, if I was to adjust my volume, now I realized I didn't hook this up, so I'm going to hook this up in a second. But if I was to adjust my volume to, let's say, here and hit play, and even drop it all the way down, it's going to go ahead and play it at a lower volume. I'll put it to zero and hit play. And you should be hearing nothing because, well, our volume's at zero. So let's see how this works and let me go ahead and fix that bug that I forgot about. Sound mixes, basically this is a way to have sounds come in and then they're mixed appropriately based on volumes and priorities. If you create a sound mix by doing sounds sound mix, you can get something like this. The sound mix basically determines um, how things are mixed together. Now the key with the sound mix is the classes that are inside of it. We have sound classes and then we have sound cues. Basically the hierarchy works is you have your cue. Your cue determines what is playing. Now we're using a sound cue because it's easier than using the sound wave itself. All my cue does is basically grab the wave that I want to play and output it. But the key here is it's outputting it using the sound class of master. Now it could be master, it could be effect, it could be wave, it could be whatever you want. In this case, if we look here, we see the different sound classes. I have master. I could set this to like effect. And we'll go ahead and set it to effect. Now it's a hierarchy type thing. So if we now opened the sound class, then we look up the music, we'll find, well, nothing but it is a child of master. So if we ever adjust the master sound class, we will affect anything below it as well. So think of this as your master volume control, individual volume control for effects, individual volume control for music. So they can be three independent volume controls, but it has a child parent relationship. For our example, you could go with just master, but I'm showing you how to use it with multiples. Now that we have that all set up, we have a sound mix, we have some sound classes, and we have a sound cue set up to use one of the sound classes. Whenever we adjust our sound mix, it's going to go ahead and trickle down and affect everything else. And that's pretty easy to do. Inside of here, if I can figure out where I put it, here we go. Anytime my volume changes, we can ignore this part for now, we are setting that new value to the volume on a sound mix overwrite. We are saying, okay, we want to adjust the master sound mix, we want to adjust the master sound class, and we want this to be the new volume. And then we're pushing that onto the mix modifier. So we're basically saying, go ahead and change the volume, and go ahead and set it now. So that way, every time we play our button in here, in this next step. it's adjusting the sound in real time. Now, one thing to note is this value, you cannot get it. Unfortunately, you can only set it. So you'll have to keep track of that value somewhere else, and that's what these other things are for. What I did was I took our game mode that we're using, since the game mode basically persists during your map, 
and I made a new variable called master volume. And all I'm doing on our pause menu is setting and getting that master volume from the game mode. So that way, when the level loads up my screen, we're grabbing whatever it's setting. And then whenever we change it, we're setting it. So if I play this, we can see we pause. I can adjust this down to like that percent, close this, pause it again, and our volume still gonna be there. Of course, I could turn it down and hit play, and now we have a very low volume. So now that that is set up, we have our simple pause menu with our simple volume control, and you should be able to easily implement this into your game jam project. Now to go ahead and fix our last display issue, it's also going to bring up another possible problem and probably a better way to fix this issue. So inside of our blueprint, whenever we slide our volume slider, we are basically setting our variable and then setting the sound mix and pushing it. Now one problem with this is it's happening every time we change the slider and it might not be the best for performance. It's the best for us. It's the best for us fixing this bug, but it might be best to not really even make these changes here until maybe we close out our pause menu. So let's go ahead and fix the bug, but keep in mind every time we do this, and you're going to see this when I do this fix here, this is going to be called every single time we do the slider. We have our value here. This is our text block. So we're going to call this the volume text block and this is going to be our volume if we were to go ahead and we're gonna grab our volume text block and we're gonna set the text on it and we are going to set this to the value that is coming out of our here so let's add a reroute node just so we can go around here and then we'll plug it into here now we're gonna come to a few issues here which we're gonna go ahead and fix as we work on this but when we hit play and pause, you'll notice, well, we have some stretching, but we're also getting, you know, the weird zero. It's it's in percent format, which isn't what we want. So we're just going to want to multiply this by 100 to get our value. And then we're going to want to make sure maybe we have some sort of fixed numbering system. So it's like 000 through 100 or something like that. So let's grab this right here to text to float and let's grab this initial number here and let's multiply where is it at multiply we'll multiply it by 100 and then we are going to plug this in here and then now we will see that we have something a little bit better we still have our fractions which we don't want but at least we have something better we're going to go ahead and minimum of three and zero fractions and then we'll go ahead and pull this back up again. And now we have our volume going from 0 to 100. And our layout really doesn't get affected by it. And of course, it should still work like we expect with our volume working properly. So that's it. That was just our quick little fix that we hadn't finished up. Basically, we'll take our values. We'll set the text value every time we change it. But again, keep in mind, this does point out, if you noticed here, let me just organize this a little better. Every single time we change the slider, our numbers change, but we are also storing a value. Not really a big deal, but we're changing our class sound mix. This probably we shouldn't do. This is probably fine. This should probably be moved more into the quit and only done like when we quit out of our screen. That way it applies the changes. 